Thank you for listening to my talk. First of all, I'd like to thank Tracy for inviting me to do this talk on the Low Carb Lifestyle Summit Long Weekend 2022. I have been so delighted to be invited for the third year in a row um, doing a talk for Tracy McBeef. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land for which we are on today and pay my respect to the elders past and present. I extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders we have today. The next thing i like to just say is I am a doctor, I'm a GP, but um, please don't treat this as uh, medical advice. Please see your own doctor for your own personal um, health journey. So i like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Avi Charlton. I'm a GP. I have been working as a GP for over 20 years in uh, Warren Turner, a suburb of Melbourne. I also work in Hawthorne at the moment. In the last few years, I have a special in, developed a special interest in nutrition and I believe in eating a low carbohydrate diet free of sugars and processed foods that can improve your health and I actually have seen a lot of improvement in many, many of my patients, especially those with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, they can improve their health by um, improving their food, by picking better food choices. And um, this has um, sparked my special interest in nutrition. I have developed further studies. I have further learning from Nutrition Network, which is a a um, education program from South, Australia, South Africa. I have also um, done some learning with Low Carb Down Under. I am now trying to pursue fellowship with ACNAM, which is Australasian College of Nutrition and Environmental Medicine. So I have done extra, extra learning and um, this has paid off and I have seen a lot of improvement in the patient's health of those that I have managed to convince to eat better nutrition. What made me do this talk about inflammation is I am seeing lots of lots and lots of inflammation around um, in my practice. Recently I did a talk on menopause. To improve menopause quite often it is a matter of improving inflammation and also with COVID going around the last two years more and more people are getting long COVID symptoms Quite often the treatment for long COVID, it is reducing inflammation. So I'm seeing inflammation all around the place. Hence, I would like to deep dive more and um, present to you what I am understanding about inflammation and how to the diseases that have been related because of inflammation, how we can improve our inflammation and um, uh, the ways that we can um, combat this um, chronic, the, to reduce the risk of chronic diseases. So let's start. In, let's define inflammation. Inflammation is a normal biological response to the body tissue to harmful stimuli such as pathogens, irritants and infections. Uh, the function of inflammation is to eliminate the initial cause of cell injury clear out dead cells and tissue damage, and initiate tissue repair. So inflammation is a normal physiological process. We all need it so we can heal and get better and get rid of the pathogens or infections that is uh, come to our body. There's different types of inflammation. There's acute and chronic. Acute inflammation is a short-term insult. Quite often it's a matter of days or few weeks, for example, you catch a cold or you catch COVID, you manage to improve symptoms and your body get better within a few days or a couple of weeks. Chronic inflammation is a prolonged insult to the body. So if your body is um, impacted by this insult for a longer period of time, for example, weeks or even months, for example, you keep eating 
some sort of nasty food and that's affecting your system and um, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, then that is a prolonged insult that can often happen for months and years. We will concentrate on chronic inflammation because your body is hard to get rid of this insult. In, in this diagram, we can see when something harmful enters the body, for example, in this case, it's a splinter. Um, your body sends out pain signals and the, the whatever area is injured becomes swollen because the white cells and the macrophages and the, it, they get released and they go to the area and try and repair your body. There's increased warmth, you feel a bit warm in the area and it becomes red because there's more blood vessels build up to try and bring more blood, bring more white cells to try and heal your body. What happens in the chronic inflammation, it lasts for months and years. It's a long-term exposure to something that is not quite right, like a toxin or an irritant. could be a food. It's insidious. The symptoms can be difficult to notice. Your body is working your immune system non-stop and um, we're trying, your body is trying to fight off this inflammation. Sometimes the symptoms are very, very fake. You can't really feel it, feels tired or brain fog or just aches and pains. I see people with just, um, sometimes they have a chronic cough, they don't know what's going on and other doctors have tried antibiotics. Sometimes they have itchiness or allergy symptoms or bowel symptoms, diarrhea, constipation. They can lose weight, they can gain weight. Or they might actually have mood symptoms, depression, anxiety. We can actually measure inflammation in the blood by these markers and there are more markers that I haven't mentioned. CRP means C-reactive protein. Um, ESR is erythrocyte sediment sedimentary rate. Um, these two markers is quite easily ordered with a simple blood test. Um, with the CRP, quite a lot of doctors think, uh, the lab thinks if you're under 10, that's normal. But I have come to learn that if you have anything over one or two, you have chronic low-grade inflammation. And I actually see it with some, doc some patients who have um, metabolic syndrome, or if they're stressed, they can actually have a, just a little bit raised CRP. So something, something to be aware of. So I looked up the Australian Bureau of Statistics and um, chronic conditions are very, very common. 47% of the Australians have chronic conditions, so almost half of the population. It's increased in the last decade from 42% to 47%. And um, female, more common, increasing in age. So the older you are, the more chances you have chronic diseases. This table is from the uh, ABS, the Bureau of Statistics. These are the chronic conditions that are most common in Australians. Mental health, back pain, back problems, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, osteoporosis, chronic obstructive airways disease, cancer, kidney disease. So if you look at all these diseases, the common theme is that they are all related to inflammation. So chronic inflammation is related to all the common, the most common chronic diseases. So what causes chronic inflammation? Foods. Sugar, gluten, dairy can cause inflammation in some people. Trans fat, processed foods, stress, poor sleep, physically inactive, insulin resistance, obesity, raised or reduced cortisol, old injuries, that if you've hurt your back or if you've got some joint pain, infections, we're seeing more and more of long COVID. Candida, SIBO is small bowel intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Lyme disease is a tick-borne disease. Dental infections, parasites, fungi, or exposure to environmental 
irritants, some chemicals or metals or some plastics. Autoimmune disorder is your body attacking your own body, so that causes some sort of inflammation. And uh, of course, smoking and too much alcohol. The first thing to talk about is, uh, of course, diet. So diet can quite often cause inflammation, ca cause chronic inflammation. The, a poor diet can cause star-induced dysbiosis. That's gut dysbiosis. It's a poor balance of good bacteria and bad bacteria. So we can actually test your gut microbiome by some stool test and we can actually find out how much good bacteria you have and how much bad bacteria you have. I'm testing more and more of these gut microbiome mapping tests now and we can also find out if, if you have intest increased intestinal impermeability. What that means is it's um, leaky gut so in the lining of your bowels the little cells that are linked together there's more gaps in between the little cells in between the we call it the tight junctions of the uh, lining of the bowels so what happens is um the endotoxins that are the, the part of the bacteria that are found in your gut microbiome that um, it actually goes into your bloodstream much more easily and that can cause inflammation so you've got to look after your bowels, especially the gut microbiome. You've got to look after good bacteria. You've got to stop the bad bacteria from growing. And the pictures in the above, one is the, they're both good bacteria. One is lactobacillus and one is bifidobacterium. And we need those good bacteria. We need to nurture those good bacteria with good foods. Drugs such as anti-inflammatories damages the lining of your gut microbiome and that can be another cause of gut dysbiosis, especially if you take anti-inflammatories long term. Alcohol, excessive alcohol long term, again, can cause increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut. The next thing to talk about, we all know sugar is bad. So what happens is your body can only hold four grams of sugar at one time so if you eat too much sugar or drink a lot of sugary drinks or sweets or donuts or treats then your body have way too much sugar and you can't handle it so it the sugar in your bloodstream causes damage to the vascular lining the blood vessels and causes the inflammation in the blood vessels that in turn increases your blood pressure, increases your risk of heart attacks. It can increase atherosclerosis. What that means is um, deposit calcium in the lining of your blood vessels. So it's um, it's the sugars not that um, benign. It uh, causes lots and lots of damages. Uh, it also causes intestinal inflammation, causes a leaky gut, damages the lining, affects your gut microbiome again. It causes the cellular damage. So increased sugar actually can damage the DNA. What happens when your body tries to repair the DNA is it can cause DNA damage. And that's how cancer can happen when the body tries to repair the DNA. So certainly increases your risk of cancer in the long term if you're a high sugar diet. It damages the collagen. So for example, you can have damaged connective tissue. You can have um, damaged joints, damage uh, that leading to arthritis. It sugar of course raises insulin. So insulin is the hormone that is responsible to bring in the, the glucose to store it to become fat. So I always say if you use your insulin, if you work your insulin too hard too often, your insulin doesn't want to work. And that is insulin resistance and eventually it can become metabolic syndrome and diabetes. So sugar is or glucose is certainly culprit or causing insulin resistance. 
insulin creates a reactive oxygen species. It increases the oxidative stress in your bloodstream. Sugar is partly glucose, partly fructose. So the fructose can is only metabolized by the liver and increases the fat production in the liver. Too much fructose, which can be caused by too much sugar or too much fruit or high fructose corn syrup or soft drinks or um, processed foods that can increase the fructose. The high fructose corn syrup is quite often in your processed foods. Increases the fat production in the liver and ultimately causes the fatty liver. Promotes weight gain, stores this fat. The fat in your body isn't just benign. It, fat is actually an organ. It can release inflammatory mediators such as cytokines and interleukin. So having body fat is um, doesn't just sit there. The next thing to talk about is um, gluten. So there's a gluten sensitivity spectrum. Some people are celiac. Celiac disease people can have no gluten at all. They actually have an allergic reaction. Little bit of gluten they eat, they actually produces an allergic reaction. So they can't have anything at all. Some people have uh, celiac light and they can be a little bit celiac and or sometimes we actually find out over a longer period of time when they get older they become frank celiacs. You can also have non-celiac gluten sensitivity so these people they're not really celiacs if you test them they don't have the genes and um, they don't if we biopsy their bowels they don't have the damage that we can see in the celiac people. But if they, they do have the symptoms, and if they stop the gluten, they have a lot of improvement. So there's studies that um, found out that a lot of people stopping gluten can improve many symptoms, including fibromyalgia, endometriosis, or even just pelvic pain. There's a study. In 2015, they tested a group of individuals, and um, they found out those people... They biopsied the bowels. Those people exposed to gliadin, all of them have increased intestinal permeability. It just shows that gl gluten affects almost everybody. In a, a study in Italy, they surveyed 486 people and um, found try and find out the symptoms of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So surely there's lots of digestive symptoms, pain, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, um, nausea. There's lots of other non-digestive symptoms as well that you don't even think about that they can be related to gluten sensitivity. Lack of well-being, tired, headache, anxiety, brain fog, numbness, weight loss, weight gain, depression, asthma, rhinitis. So I always say if you have some sort of unwell and we think it could be related to gluten, go try gluten-free and try it for three or four weeks. And um, if you have improvement in symptoms, then certainly you might have this non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I myself actually hardly eat any, any gluten at all and um, I'm not celiac, so... I think for most people, gluten is not that good for you. Gluten includes rye, oats, uh, barley, and um, uh, uh, rye, barley, oats, and wheat. So um, the uh, so that all is incorporated in. They all have the protein called gliadin. So how to go on a gluten-free diet? Eat mainly protein, meat, eggs, chicken, fish, nuts and seeds, fats and good fats and good oils, fruits and veggies, herbs and spices. You may want to eat some gluten-free gluten grains if you're 
not insulin resistant. So rice, quinoa, corn, buckwheat can be okay if you are gluten, if you want to get rid of gluten and you're insulin sensitive. Foods that we that often have gluten is um, of course your bread and the muffins, cookies, cakes, snacks, crackers, chips. Noodles often have gluten, so be careful of noodles, pastas. Um, cereals often have gluten. You can get gluten-free cereals, but gluten cereals is processed foods, so I would avoid that as much as you can. Some sources that we don't know have hidden gluten, like soy sauce, oyster sauce, teriyaki sauce, and some gravy can have gluten. So you've got to be careful and look at your the um, the food label and be sure if you want to go gluten free. Another main cause of inflammation, I believe, is processed foods. There's this study that I mentioned right down the bottom. They looked at the processed foods. Ultra processed foods increases the risk of cardiovascular disease by seven percent. These foods often have sugars and trans fat. They are linked to hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome. They can often change your taste bud and make you eat more and more. These include refined carbohydrates, artificial sweeteners, additives and artificial flavorings. It changes your gut microbiome. These foods quite often is uh, pros highly processed. They have had heat treatment and um, the processing leads them to advanced glycation end products which increases oxidative stress and inflammation so these foods can include the, your uh, supermarket breads that's highly processed even the flours is highly processed so a lot of carbohydrates especially the refined carbohydrates is all highly processed they can certainly increase your inflammation increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, um, causes endothelial dysfunction, that means it, it causes the vascular, the blood vessels to be inflamed, increases your risk of obesity, metabolic syndrome. In terms of dairy, some people can tolerate dairy no problem, but lactose intolerance is so common more than half of the population can have lactose intolerant. Hello, Boop. There's a dog. So, if you have lactose intolerant, it's a matter of amount. So, sometimes a little bit of dairy is okay. So, I often have um, cream and cheese, and they're actually quite okay in me. Um, but if I drink a glass of milk, then I'll be in trouble. So, um, with lactose intolerant, is a dose-dependent thing, but um, of course, too much can increase your inflammation. Trans fat is highly processed fats, and they certain, these trans fats includes all your seed oils, your vegetable oil, canola oil, soybean, sunflower oil, margarine, cotton seed oil. Quite often, the processed foods and the uh, is all got the the trans fat in it, so this trans fat quite often can it, it, it can actually increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. It increase induces the intest intestinal inflammation. It changes your gut microbiome, increases the risk of cancer. If you test the uh, inflammatory markers, we can find your CRP and ESR to be raised. And it damages the blood vessels. It reduces the HDL. So um, sometimes it does reduce the total cholesterol, but um, the good cholesterol, the HDL, quite often is reduced and the triglyceride is increased. So I stick to the good fats, the butter, tallow, ghee, avocado oil, olive oil, fish oil, and even the fat around the meat and the eggs is all healthy fat. So um, let's talk about other things other than your diet that can cause inflammation. Stress. Too much stress can increase inflammation. 
not so the depression isn't just because of something happening quite often is it's the inflammation caused by the changes in your gut microbiome your bowel talks to your brain your gut bacteria actually can is linked to your brain and can cause inflammation that's called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal HPA axis stress also activates the sympathetic nervous system and if you don't have enough parasympathetic nervous system to do some more rest and digest this chronic inflammation chronic stress can increase your chronic inflammation there's also studies showing that adverse childhood events the more adverse childhood events you have the higher chance of chronic diseases like heart disease lung disease depression um, stress can also increase degenerative um, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and um, cancer. Poor sleep or lack of sleep can increase inflammation. So we need to prioritize our sleep. This study shows that sleep deprivation increases your acute phase response and increase white cells, increase inflammatory markers and cytokines, raises your blood pressure, increases your insulin resistance and of course it goes to obesity and even all cause mortality and so and even cancer so the sometimes i tell patients to eat good and go low carb and reduce eat a good nutritious diet they come back and they can tell me they actually feel better they lose weight so and they actually sleep better so sleeping better often reduces inflammation so if you don't prioritize your sleep you're stressed you're busy not going to bed early enough that can increase your inflammation the more you are inflamed and the poorer sleep you get so again that's a vicious cycle um, chronic infections is another thing that we're seeing more and more often especially long COVID some people have some inflammation before they catch COVID and this COVID can exacerbate the inflammation so the idea to treatment of long COVID quite often is the, uh, the variety of ways that we can to reduce inflammation some people actually get COVID and the COVID causes the inflammation even though they're fit and healthy I have seen some friends that are fit and healthy they get COVID and the COVID causes all this inflammation other viruses that can cause chronic inflammation, HIV, EBV, it's uh, Epstein-Barr virus that causes glandular fever and that's related to chronic fatigue syndrome or myoencephalitic um, myositis. CMV, hepatitis B, herpes, bacterial infections such as Helicobacter, if you let it sit in the bowel for a long period of time, this Helicobacter can cause an inflammation chronic inflammation in your stomach increases your risk of stomach cancer. SIBO is a small bowel intestinal bacterial overgrowth that can cause bloating and uh, um, bowel symptoms, chronic inflammation in the bowels. Parasites, long-term fungus and yeast infection in the bowel overgrowth that can again cause chronic inflammation. Um, prion disease is mad cow disease, not really seen that much in Australia. Um, the next thing to mention is the environment. So we have so much environmental irritants and toxins, um, pollution, chemicals, even radiation, mold, plastics, agricultural, agricultural products, building materials and even just climate change, um, electromagnetic field that's caused by the Wi-Fi in the house, mobile phones, 5G, UV radiation can certainly increase your inflammation if you're, certain, if you're exposed to all these environmental toxins. These, uh, there's a lot of toxins that 
can, this is a big list and certainly not exhaustive. There can be many more environmental toxins. All these chemicals that we don't pay attention of, like makeups, moisturizers, shampoo, conditioners, toothpaste, sunscreen, food wraps, plastics, pesticides, even just plastic drink bottles. Even if it says BPA free, there are other chemicals in the plastic that can leak into the water that you drink if you use the plastic bottle. And um, building materials, chemicals, even glyphosate from the um, farm products can often is quite toxic to your body. These environmental toxins are related to all these diseases that um, again is related to chronic inflammation, so allergies, respiratory diseases, even um, childhood diseases like autism or ADHD, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, cancer, chronic fatigue, Chronic inflammatory response syndrome can be caused by long-term mold exposure in your house. So these are the diseases that can be associated with increased inflammation. Virtually all the chronic diseases that I've mentioned before. And this diagram is a very good diagram showing all the different body parts that can be affected by long-term chronic inflammation so brain disorders depression anxiety alzheimer's multiple sclerosis cardiovascular diseases hypertension muscle aches and pains like polymyalgia or arthritis bone diseases osteoporosis we don't often think that's inflammatory but your inflammation affects the balance between the osteoblasts and osteoclasts that's the cells that's responsible for making bones and breaking down bones. So the higher inflammation you have, the more chances you can have osteoporosis. Skin diseases, like even acne, eczema, psoriasis, even wrinkles. So aging in your skin, the more infl inflammation you have, the more aging you get. So if you want to look young, you can reduce inflammation. Thyroid diseases is, um, includes the autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, causes a hypothyroid or a, a hyperthyroid. Quite often I found that it is related to gut dysbiosis. So if we improve the gut, that can actually improve your thyroid conditions without actually having thyroid treatment. Lung diseases like airways disease, asthma, allergies, gut disorders, reflux gastroesophageal reflux or Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel diseases. If we improve your um, food, quite often that can improve gastroesophageal reflux, like improving the, reducing the sugar and the carbohydrates that can improve the gourd, that's a, that's a reflux. Kidney diseases can be related to hypertension. So reducing sugars and processed foods, I've seen many people that can improve their blood pressure just by improving reducing the carbohydrates and the sugar and the processed foods in the diet. Liver, so fatty liver can quite often to be related to your sugar and especially your fructose intake. So how to reduce inflammation? Reduce inflammatory foods. Eat more anti-inflammatory foods, which we'll go in in the next slide. Minimize anti-inflammatory. So anti-inflammatory is just helps short term in the long term it damages your gut lining it's not really doesn't help with inflammation exercise regularly make sure you sleep manage your stress and fasting can be very helpful to reduce inflammation what are the inflammatory foods as we said sugars simple carbohydrates high fructose corn syrup processed foods Trans fat like the seed oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, margarine, omega 6, gluten in some a lot of people can be inflammatory, dairy to a lot of people can be inflammatory as well. So these foods can have anti inflammatory properties. I always say prioritize your protein because that's where the nutrients is. So meat, eggs, chicken, fish 
eat the majority of those. Grass-fed is better. If it's if you eat fish, fish has very good anti-inflammatory properties. Properties, wild caught is better than farm fish. Vegetables, if you are insulin um, resistant, then you should try and do above ground vegetables rather than root vegetables. Quite often have a high carbohydrate content, breaks down, become glucose. Polyphenols is colorful veggies like berries and purple cabbages. Um, nuts and dark chocolate, green tea, curcumin or turmeric can have anti-inflammatory properties. Ginger and garlic, coffee have antioxidant properties. EPA and DHA, avocado, olive oil. Making sure you have enough micronutrients, in, including magnesium, vitamin D, vitamin E. Zinc has good immune, improves your immune system. Selenium, glutathione is, an, is a very good antioxidant. Prebiotics and probiotics. So prebiotics feeds into the good bacteria. That's like your um, uh, lactulose or inulin that feeds into the good bacteria. Probiotics is in like the, the yogurt with lactobacillus or saccharomyces. That actually improves your gut microbiome as well. Bone broth and apple cider vinegar, they all have good anti-inflammatory properties. Exercise is certainly very, very important. Exercise releases anti-inflammatory mediators and it inhibits the pro-inflammatory cytokines. You, you still have to eat a good diet. You can't outrun a bad diet, but um, having exercise can improve a bit and, and um, can be uh, reduce inflammation. It, exercise certainly reduces your fat and the adipose tissue, adipose tissue can, um, if you have less fat, that can have less inflammation coming out of the fat. Reduces blood pressure, improves its insulin sensitivity, especially with good strength training, building muscles that can improve insulin resistance. However, you've got to be careful. Long, prolonged exercises, um, too much exercise can actually have the adverse effect of increasing CRP and produ production of oxidants. So you've got to, if you have long exercises, you've got to have periods of rest. So you've got to balance it out. And if you have run a marathon, then you've got to have more time to rest after the marathon to try and repair your body. I usually say if you run a lot, you need to build up muscles so you can, so your muscles can eat help your body to strength train and reduce inflammation the other ways. I always say you have to prioritize your rest. I myself exercise six days a week and have one complete rest day a week. Sometimes in certain periods I rest even more, especially if I feel busy or run down. I like to make a, a note, a special note on vitamin D. Vitamin D, we always say, helps with osteoporosis, but it's not just that. It's not just for bone health. It reduces inflammation. It's important for immunoregulation. And um, low vitamin D can increase your risk of inflammatory conditions like cardiovascular disease, inflammatory bowel disease. And so some studies showing that supplementing with vitamin D can actually improve arthritis type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune conditions. So just to note, the lab quite often says um, they want above 50 of vitamin D and if they're above 50, they are happy. However, I've learned that the optimal vitamin D level is 75. If you have more than 100, that's even better. So in Australia, in, especially in Melbourne, there's really not much sun, especially in winter. I actually tell my patients everyone should supplement with vitamin D because I see it so often and um, quite often the vitamin D in the sunlight is not enough. Fasting is another very good method to reduce your inflammation. It reduces oxidative damage, improves your 
um, metabolism increases BDNF. Exercise is another thing that increases BDNF. That's brain-derived neurotropic factor. Makes you happy. It's got positive effect in cancer prevention and even treatment. It's neuroprotective in, uh, for example, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and Huntington's. Improves metabolic syndrome. Increases your insulin sensitivity. So um, fasting. What I mean by fasting is not eating for at least 12 hours. Sometimes some people can fast for 16 hours or 18 hours or even 24 hours or even a few days. So all that can have good benefits. I always say if you have, if you fast 12 hours overnight, let's say from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. you eat nothing, that's fantastic. And if you avoid your snacks, eat your meals and have two or three meals a day, time-restricted eating, that can also have very good benefits in terms of all this that I have mentioned, as well as improving your insulin sensitivity. Other things that I have um, found that reduces inflammation, breathing exercises. You can look up vagal breathing, so that's deep breathing exercises that can actually improve your parasympathetic nervous system, reduce inflammation, improve your well-being and reduce stress. Yoga, stretching, practicing mindfulness, cold showers, even if you have very short period of cold showers and then turn it turn your temperature up again or a few bouts of cold shower that can have benefits with reducing inflammation sunlight sunlight doesn't just give you vitamin d sunlight gives you lots more other benefits other than just vitamin d going out into the nature uv sauna is fantastic having a pet or more than one i have mambo in the picture here practicing sitting next to me supporting me in practicing my yoga and having less artificial lighting can improve inflammation so in summary inflammation can be chronic inflammation and quite often it's insidious it's uh, people can't feel that it's happening it can cause very vague symptoms like brain fog tired and it can be a cause of multiple chronic conditions like cardiovascular, increases your risk of cardiovascular diseases, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and even cancer. So how to reduce inflammation? Eat a nutritious diet, manage your stress, practice yoga, meditation, mindfulness. Fasting is also very good. Exposing yourself into the sun, good physical activity, prioritizing your sleep good healthy relationships so have a connection good socialize with your friends avoiding smoking alcohol and drugs maintaining a good healthy weight so all those things can contribute to improve your inflammation this is the end of my talk i thank you to listen that you have listened to the end of my talk I hope this has um, made you more aware of inflammation and ways that you can do to improve your lifestyle, to reduce inflammation and hence reduce the risk of chronic diseases. I'm a GP. I've been a GP for over 20 years. I work in Melbourne in Victoria in Australia. You can follow me on the social media on Facebook and Instagram, Dr. Charlton Low Carb GP. And my website is www.dravichartlton.com. I'm also part of the admin group of Low Carb Melbourne, which is an inclusive Facebook group, and uh, we support a f we support a low carbohydrate lifestyle. You're most welcome to join us, even if you don't live in Melbourne. I thank you for listening to me to the end. Thank you. Have a lovely day.